Welcome to the Science of Parenting Podcast, where we connect you with research-based information that fits your family. We'll talk about the realities of being a parent and how research can help guide our parenting decisions. I'm Mackenzie Johnson, parent of two littles with their own quirks, and I'm a parenting educator. And I'm Suzanne Bartholomew. I'm an associate professor who strives to help people increase their financial security, and I'm the parent of a high schooler. Yes, and we're here talking. We get to talk about high schoolers today, right? Yeah. I'll say we're going to be digging in. We've been talking. We're doing a little snippet of episodes here in the middle related to like how to talk with our kids about money, but at what age of kids? Like, what are they doing? What are they learning? And so last week we talked about childhood, both like preschoolers and school agers and some of the things they're learning. And this week, talking about teens, which it's like, this is exciting and scary and exciting. <laughs> but also scary. <laughs> but teens aren't so scary. I give them a bad rap. They're not so scary. Um, a lot of great things, actually. We're going to tap into this episode when we talk about our teens. So as a reminder, last week, we introduced this idea of the financial capability. Remember, there were three building blocks. So we talked about executive function as the first one, financial habits and norms, and financial knowledge and decision-making skills. So these are the three building blocks of financial capability. So we talked about them in childhood. We're going to talk about them with teens. And then next week, we're going to talk about them with another age group. So three building blocks, executive function, financial habits and norms, and financial knowledge and decision-making skills. Right, Suzanne? That's right. Yeah. And so something we didn't talk about last week, which we both kind of were surprised, like, we're saying, yeah, like, we didn't talk ooh. about different rates of development um, <laughs> in individual, you know, individuals yes. right yes. so um so these building blocks are accumulating in an overlapping mm -hmm. fashion is one thing i would say about mm -hmm. these three building blocks but getting back to that importance of understanding that each child is different in terms of their um their executive function you know how their impulse mm -hmm. control their ability for attention and and focus and also their skills, things like numeracy skills. Again, that math being so mm -hmm. important and math really emerging in this in this uh, broad period of development. Oh, yes. um, and then the other point I think that we wanted to make was that we know that uh, development is lifelong. I'm still mm -hmm. developing, especially my executive function skills. <laughs> Same. <laughs> being able to you know delay gratification. Who doesn't mm -hmm. struggle with that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, we. I like when. You pointed that out when we started walking through this, like, you know, and we should really tell people that kids develop at different rates. I'm like, oh, that's probably the expertise. Like, I should have probably thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> Whoopsie. But so we're telling you now, yeah. your teens each develop at their own rate. And all of your children, all of the children of all of the ages, <laughs> uh, everybody develops at their own rate um, based on lots of things. But when you were talking about this idea of how these building blocks accumulate and overlap, I was like, oh, yeah, this it's not like one or the other. Right. It's not like we did this and then we did that and then we did that. Right. It's like just together. And it kind of made me I'm tapping into Lori's skills. Right. Lori often gave us a word picture to explain a concept. And I'm kind of picturing like a Jenga tower. Right. And so there's like this kind of foundation. And almost if we would even give really going to dig into the details of this word picture, like a different color for each of these building blocks, right? So like maybe executive functioning is yellow. And so since that develops in childhood or a lot of it, right, that's where they kind of get started in the younger years, there might be a lot of yellow at the bottom of this Jenga tower. And then we trickle in these other things, right? But it's not, they overlap. So it's not like it's all yellow, right? There might be like green and red kind of trickled in. And then as it keeps building, then we start to see more of, let's say, financial habits is green. So you start to see more green, but there's still red and yellow blocks in there, right? Our kids who are in like school age are still learning some executive function and still learning some financial knowledge. Um, but they're building a lot of like they're doing a lot of work around habits and norms. And then in the teen years, I'm going to go red, I guess. Financial knowledge is going to be red. That's the area or they're doing all of them because they overlap and accumulate. But a lot is happening in this financial knowledge area for them. That building block is a huge one that's happening for teens, right? Right. Yeah. So I absolutely love the word picture. I think it's a wonderful, <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> it's a wonderful um, way to think about things. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, knowing that the um, last week when we talked about 
the the younger children that that executive mm-hmm. function is really where the emphasis is with the mm-hmm. preschoolers versus so that impulse control and ability yes. to check your emotions right we're not going to mm-hmm. be seeing that as much in the teen years hopefully mm-hmm. i mean yes. it's not that it's not still <laughs> there strong. you know um but and then the, the financial habits and norms being uh, the important in the middle school or middle age um Mm-hmm. Brought, middle childhood that, that middle childhood period yeah exactly <laughs> yes. but when we think about the three developmental stages they're mm-hmm. really based on again when an individual will commonly acquire a particular skill an attitude mm-hmm. a habit so again like those numeracy skills yes. cognitive abilities um and and attitudes so that's one uh i think big factor that um our development is based on yes. and then just also their rate of development across just your, yeah, different your mature, domains yeah your maturity yes. and then the big piece for the jenga blocks and we um, <laughs> talked you know thought about this is that when a, a child gets access to financial decision making and experience mm. is really going to be key. Yes. So is uh, the red block of um, financial knowledge and decision making coming earlier in the tower or is mm. it later in the tower? Is there, um, you know, earning money, allowing, um, you know, just different capacities to be built? And, yes. and I think we talked about, you know, the environment, our family, you know, think mm-hmm. about the child of an entrepreneur. And they're their yes. Jenga block who may be a child who goes to, you know, um, you know, goes to work with their parents because they're they're business owners. And so they're mm-hmm. involved in maybe some of the day to day functioning of the business and they're picking up communication skills, organizational skills, um, yes. you know, all like knowledge as well. And so their blocks in their color. Uh, just love the Jenga. The cut their color <laughs> tower is going to look a little bit different. So I think that's a really good yes. way to visualize development. Yes. Well, and then, uh, you know, I also hear, you know, talking about how it's different for each person based on one, their like natural development rate, but two, right, which we don't necessarily influence and then or have much influence, I should say. But then we can influence how much access or experience they get with financial decision making. Right. At, and at which ages. But that's going to change their tower. So everybody's tower looks different. So like my tower versus your tower versus you as a listener versus my child versus your child, right? Like everybody's tower looks different in the color, but maybe even in like the size, right? Like the number of blocks, right? If they have experiences where they get a lot of chances to try out financial skills, they might be getting more blocks than someone who, let's say, like I didn't have a job in high school. I didn't start really managing money until like my senior year and that was because my mom was like, hey, if you're going to go to college, you got to tr- try something out. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And so I maybe didn't have as many building blocks as some of my peers. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, mm-hmm. that's and even e- now, don't. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great example. And and we've been talking all season about access, right? Mm-hmm. So access to a financial product, um, access to parent modeling with different mm-hmm. financial decisions and um habits right so yes that is gonna influence the blocks and what's and what's in place absolutely okay so a few things that we just covered like all together here we the, these three building blocks of financial capability still talking about those and but that there's variation right there's variation in each of us in our own development and in when we get these experiences that's a big influence on how and like the rate at which these develop and so i think that's really important for us you know to kind of understand that they accumulate it's not like all like the bottom is all yellow the middle is all green and the top is all red right they're right. they're overlapping um, right and and together. as parents you know the first thing we're told when we have an infant i think and now we're already in the teen years and we're talking about teens <laughs> right uh, and so rem- we barely remember what it was like to hold our infant right when yeah. we get to the teen years but we're told you know don't compare your child to mm. your infant or your toddler your toddler's not crawling well let's not compare that to mm. someone that's walking because they're on their own trajectory right yeah and that just is comforting to know that like it's okay you know that yes and and just a reminder gentle reminder that everyone looks different mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and in this yeah. area too right we've talked so too. often about like the cognitive right like the thinking domain versus the physical domain of like how the body develops versus the social emotional brain okay but also this domain of like money and financial like knowledge skills capability this is another domain. And so it's okay if our kids, right, might be further, their, their block tower might have more blocks or their block tower might have less blocks for a huge variety of reasons. Like you said, like environment, parenting, organizations, experiences, like all of these things. Mm-hmm. Um, so it could be different. That's okay. It yeah. should be. 
it will be. <laughs> <laughs> right. Will and be. Then all the, 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 the domains that you mentioned are feeding into the financial domain as well, right? Mm -hmm. The social emotional yes. development feeds into executive function, cognitive mm. development feeds into financial knowledge and decision making. Yes, you know, and 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 so on. So yes, and absolutely. that oh, that accumulative, accumulative, uh, and and overlapping fashion of all these domains. Oh yes, yeah. Again, all like they're all together. We could use this Jenga analogy for all of the <laughs> development right oh my gosh yeah it's all gonna be once. the only one i use yeah now i'm like okay everything's jenga just everything from here on in <laughs> <laughs> okay awesome well we want to dig in to talking specifically about teens across these um three building blocks of financial capability so i'm actually going to steal some tidbits that suzanne told me earlier uh about when these start so <laughs> I can steal that from you, Suzanne. Oh, yeah. I thought it was really interesting. Um, so let's talk first about this idea of executive function, right? We talked a lot about it related to preschoolers, but as you said, it's still developing all the way across. It doesn't stop. And so executive function, uh, we start developing it at age three. But here's some of the tidbits specific to the teen years that this is a table um, directly from a Consumer Finance Protection Bureau report. My new bestie. I love them. <laughs> so the few things they tell us about executive function in teens. What we know is that teens are starting to demonstrate some more critical thinking skills. And that affects how they understand and use money. I love this one. That our teens, more than the age groups before them, are really starting to get some future orientation. They're thinking about the future. And like, right, their brain literally processes it in a different way than like, a 10 year old does that it like gets a little more concrete and like, okay, if I want these things and I'm thinking about wanting these things in the future, I will be doing things now that affect it. Um, so they are starting to get some real great skills and knowledge related to future orientation. And then that future orientation, along with the critical thinking, they are starting to demonstrate their ability to plan ahead and delay gratification. And even though I'm like, yes, look at teens go, all oh, this great executive function. I'm like, and I think a key phrase is start. <laughs> They're starting <laughs> to, right? They don't have it mastered. They don't have the lived experience of an adult who's learned, like you said, school of hard knocks, right? Maybe learn the hard way. Um, but they are starting to demonstrate this. They cognitively are getting there and it's a great opportunity for us as parents to build on that. So, I want to toss to you, Suzanne. You have a lot of insight how this specifically relates teens and finances and money. So talk about executive function in teens. Tell me, what are your insights? Yeah, so just as a reminder, strong executive function makes it easier to plan, uh, to focus attention, remember details, multitask. So uh, teens are starting to demonstrate, you know, their their ability to do some problem solving, mm -hmm. maybe to break big tasks down into smaller chunks, right, so that they yes. can manage uh, and plan. Um, they're starting to maybe have some successes with Ooh, financial yeah. um planning and goal setting. And, and a lot of that is executive function, right? So yes. being able to delay gratification and um, critically think about, okay, um, how am I going to accomplish that goal? Mm -hmm. Right. So yeah. Um, yeah. And for the first time they might be um, earning income. Right. Mm. And, and, and that's one thing about teens is that for the first the last several, like the last generation or so um, have really come into a lot of money in terms of being actors in the economy. Mm. Right. So they have more money at their disposal and they're engaging in the economic yes. system more, th more than um, previous generations. So. so that executive function, like they're going to be using it. Right. Yeah. When they yeah. like we know that our teens can have some income or have at least have access in whatever form that comes to some things. And so they're going to be using that executive function. We okay. are, and, and we continue oh. to. Right? Oh, yes. <laughs> <It doesn't laughs> that stop. impulse control. We didn't and yeah. Yeah, right. we didn't say that about our Jenga, like word picture of like, there's no ceiling in this room that we're building our Jenga, right? Like it, it keeps, it keeps it like, I'm building it, you're building it, we're all building it. <laughs> yeah, those blocks, we need to, I always need these blocks to shore us up in our financial behavior. <laughs> yes. Okay, let's move on to the second building block, which is financial habits and norms. So Again, Suzanne taught me. The literature tells us this starts to develop around age six, which is what we said last week, right? In middle childhood, our school agers, they're starting to get a sense and like develop their money persona, if you will. A few tidbits from the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau related to teens and their financial habits and norms. 
developmentally, they're starting to have a more positive attitude toward planning and saving and frugality and self-control. We love that. They're starting to show positive money management habits and decision-making skills. They can make spending and saving. I love this one. They can make spending and saving decisions that are aligned with their goals and values. I think of my sweet schoolager who like every time comes into a dollar wants to go buy candy, right? Or like wants to go make that, like make this impulsive, uh, in my opinion, purchase. <laughs> but our <laughs> teens are starting to like, you know what? Actually, I want to do this thing. And maybe the value is belonging. Maybe the value is education. Maybe the value, right? It can look different for each teen, but they're starting to make money decisions. Their habits uh, can align with those. And then finally, uh, they're starting to get confident. They're having a little more like confidence in themselves about their age-appropriate financial tasks. Like, I know I'm going to need to put gas in my car, right? And so they can start to get confident of like, okay, yep, I know I'm going to have gas money. And so they're really building some confidence in this area, which affects their habits and norms too. So yeah, that's what yeah. they tell us about these milestones from the CFPB. <laughs> like you had some yeah. really interesting insight here though too, Suzanne. Yeah. So they're, they're really learning about um, opportunity costs and trade-offs to some of those financial decisions that they're, they're making. And do I save my money uh, mm -hmm. for a personal item, whether, you know, it's something like a cell phone or skin, mm -hmm. skin products, like yes. I mentioned, my daughter is really into <laughs> Um, but they are, you know, we talked uh, a couple seasons, um, I mean, episodes about this model of financial action and the influence mm -hmm. of um, like the environment and social environment. And that shapes our habits and our, our norms yes. as well. And so I think we were talking about how there's some uh, research with teens around the Great Recession when that happened yeah. and how they really do pay attention and they worry about the economy, at least based on the study that um, yes. like adults, you know, they're. Um, their the, the economy is impacting their saving and spending because they indicated that yeah I'm spending my money differently um, yes. I'm spending less because of the economy um, they're talking to their friends about it so we may not mm -hmm. think that uh, teens are paying attention but they but they really are and right when you and some are anxious about it too you know or like they were at the yes. time yeah yes when you shared you know the first time you shared this when we were walking through this this insight I was like oh my gosh, I do not give teens enough credit, right? I'm already give, <laughs> like, I'm giving them bad rap in the earlier part of the episode, but that yeah. their habits and norms were shaped, right? They were paying attention I, to the economy and that the way they were actually doing things, and again, aligns with their values, right? right. They're using their saving and spending and the ways that align with their values of, okay, I'm concerned that I'm not going to have enough money for blank or that my saving isn't going to go how I planned because of, things that are happening um and are like in the world and they're yeah paying attention. they're paying and attention <laughs> they are paying attention and then and there's another study when and this is at the individual level that asks mm -hmm. teens like who is responsible for you know, like whose job Ooh. is it to be responsible for money and more than half say that it's their job and only about a third said oh, i share it with the, uh, it's a shared job between me and my parents interesting yeah yeah interesting. so so again like as we get to the teen years being responsible and and instilling a sense of responsibility parents are doing a pretty good job if over half of them are saying yes. it's, it's solely my, i mean you we want them to know that we're there for support mm -hmm. but you know at the same time we're our goal is to get them to independence which yes. we'll talk about right next week <laughs> yep yep that's still coming or next episode rather yes it's coming oh awesome okay so let's talk about this third category so i told you in the last episode about like the green check marks right of like which age and which building block are they doing a lot of work around and so for teens this is that area mm -hmm. teens are doing a lot of work around their financial knowledge and decision making skills so um the literature tells us this really starts to expand and develop around age 13. So right at the beginning of these teen years, they're really digging in to this knowledge. And so here's what we know from the CFPB, that teens are grasping more advanced financial processes and concepts like taxes, like investing. In part, you mentioned because of their math skills. They like they know how to do percentages and like, oh, this is, I'm so embarrassed. Uh, exponents, right? Like something squared. I was like, the word, there's a math word. <laughs> but they give new math skills, yeah. right? And so they understand investing and they can understand some of these things in a different way. So they're advancing some of the more advanced or they're grasping some of the more advanced skills and processes. 
they're starting to manage their mo own money to reach their goals, right? And so part of that is their habits, but there's also a level of knowledge, right? Like I know how to make those decisions. And then the third little tidbit they had here is that, and I think this one is really like, yeah, interesting for teens. They're starting to identify trusted sources of financial information mm -hmm. and to process, like make decisions and accurately process it. Like, well, actually, maybe I don't trust this particular source of information or I really should trust it or I'm not sure. So I need to figure this out. Like I need to find another source. They're starting to really do that process for financial decisions. Yeah. So they're learning how to be good consumers. Yeah. Right. Which, you know, we've talked about that financial knowledge piece is being able to find the unbiased and reliable information, mm. process it and act on it. And again, the acting on it falls back and overlaps with the executive function. Do you follow sure through does. on something? Right. So, yeah. So they're starting to develop firsthand knowledge. Right. And skills because they're. Um, money like if they're earning money then mm -hmm. it's just much more relevant for them so they're beginning they're, they're making purchases for the first time maybe maybe mm -hmm. earlier they've had some experience um maybe they're opening a bank account maybe um they're borrowing you know well, we're mm -hmm. going to get to the later ages i mean this is, goes mm -hmm. all the way up to 21 but some are going to be borrowing um but there was a survey of teens about what they want to learn about money and so that would really fall on this oh. knowledge ca category yes. and what skills they want i um, thought this and list was so like as a parent, I don't have teens yet, but as a parent, like, what should I be teaching them? Like, yeah. and so this idea of like, what did they actually want to know? I love this. So, hey, parents, yeah. teens, listen up. Listen She's going to give us a good list here. <laughs> I am. And, and well, it's an interesting list. And then also just know that they're, they are eager to, eager to learn. I don't think mm -hmm. I mentioned that to you that, you know, mm -hmm. when we ask teens, do you want to learn about money? more than half are very eager to learn about money. So yes. they want to know about how financing works for large purchases mm -hmm. like cars or, or homes. Mm -hmm. And again, it gets into that relevancy of the information for anybody mm -hmm. at any age. Like yes. if it's relevant to me, I want to know about it. They're interested in learning how um, money grows. So about how invest like investing money. Mm -hmm. They're interested in identity theft and how to protect uh, themselves which yes. I thought was surprising. And then they just want to know the basics of like budgeting, checking accounts and credit cards. Um, mm -hmm. But what I think is really interesting and it gets back to this kind of sense of responsibility piece is mm -hmm. like, why do they want to know the topics? That was a follow-up question to once yes. they identify the topics. And the the top reason was, or the, the largest majority of teens said was that they want to know this information so that they can pay their bills. So they, ah. can, stay out of, they can stay out of debt. Um, so they don't have to rely on others for money. Again, mm -hmm. that, you know, I'm solely responsible for managing my money, not my parents. Um, mm -hmm. Being able to take care of their family, which, you know, that sense of yeah. community or, you know, not just being the self-centered teen that we think about, right? Right. We, we don't give them enough teens. credit. No. Uh -uh. Not enough and then, credit. And on the last on the list, like the smaller proportion was that they want to buy things they like, which again, mm. I think we probably um, pigeonhole the teens into being like yes. they're selfish and they just want to, you know, buy stuff for themselves. Well, you know, this this particular survey did not bear out that mm -hmm. that assumption or bias. Yes. And I do think that's important for us to recognize. And again, this is a this is a like a this is research. We always have like a dose of reality in here. Right. Where our kid falls on these. Mm -hmm. Which topic? Not every single kid. We're not saying every single kid is interested in every single one of these, but that these are topics as a group that teens might be thinking about that we might have opportunities or can start to think about opportunities um, to start sharing this with our teens. Um, and yes, their reason my may have may be on the list or might not be, uh, depending on their values and experiences and things. Uh, so I think that's a great opportunity. One thing we haven't talked about that. I'm like, okay, I feel almost feel like we need a moment to just dig in here is like, what is it? What are some things about the teen years that are unique related to money? Um, you know, so some we've kind of mentioned in passing, but I'm like, okay, this is the age where they're allowed to get jobs, right? This is an age where they have some independence with like, you know, they might have a vehicle or some of their own form of transportation. Um, their belonging is a huge thing in the teen years, right? That's like a huge developmental um, they want to belong with their peers a lot of the time. And so that can influence their decision making um, financially. And I, you also said like their access, right? Their access to the world outside of just what their parents show them, right? Whether that's social media or the internet or just school in general. Um, anything you'd add that I'm like, we've kind of mentioned some, but anything you'd add that's specific to the teen years related to money? 
I think that the biggest piece is that um, the, the fact that they're earning, they have access mm. to money, and whether it's through allowances, gifts, or a job, mm -hmm. you know, how, however they're, they have access to it. So they're managing and making their own purchase decisions, mm -hmm. I think, excuse me, independently, maybe for the first time, whereas yes. we may be more, because we're not with them all the time, right? They're mm -hmm. out, inter they're interfacing with the, you know, uh, with society, without us, yes. unlike maybe our elementary school children, right, or mm -hmm. uh, middle school kids, it, it's they start to you know become more independent. But we're not really monitoring them, so they do have to independently be able to make some some good choices. Yes, yes. And okay. I know you like to to hit on the 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 piece about that you're we're providing their safe opportunities to make yes. decisions, low They're, consequence. Yeah, yes, low, yeah, yeah. So that's that's the big piece too. Mm -hmm. And not the right to them. It might feel very high consequence. Like I had planned to do this thing, like buy the, like buy this personal item, like these shoes, or I really wanted to buy this chair, like this piece of furniture for my room or this collection of books from this author. I really like right this album that I like from this artist. Right. Yeah. They have specific financial interest, like interests, mm -hmm. right. That like, this oh, is yeah. how I want to spend my money. Um, and yeah, that sometimes, they might not get to, right? They might like make a decision again. It feels like a high consequence to them. Like I wanted to do that. And I ended up going to the movies with my friends or we ended up going somewhere and spending money. And now I don't have enough to do that. Like that's low consequence in terms of the scheme of like, wow, sometimes the adult consequences of things, <laughs> but it can feel high consequence to them. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a, a, a good, um, uh, yeah, I mean, not a good, it's a, a great observation, really, um, in mm. terms of like, you set a goal, and then all of a sudden you get derailed because of your executive function skills yes. are not strong enough, <laughs> right? You don't delay gratification. Right. And that's like, again, that's the and starts to develop at age, yeah, starts to develop at age three, still developing, not done developing <laughs> the executive <laughs> no. functioning, for sure. Yeah, yeah. And the variety of, of interests, I think, is a really good point, mm. too. I think some kids are saving for a concert ticket, you know, others want to yes. do a sport. Um, mm -hmm. And so you could be priced in or out of those um, interests, very, Absolutely. you know, depending on what it is. Mm -hmm. And there, and that's a really great point. There are some interests that are like wildly expensive, mm -hmm. right? I even think of, I have a friend who like her parents would joke about, they had horses um, and she was very, like, she did a lot of like you know, she did shows, she did a lot with her horses and she goes, and her parents used to joke like, this is an incredibly expensive hobby, <laughs> right? Like horses, we have to feed them. <laughs> this is different than, you know, like books. <laughs> or tennis, like, yeah, picking up right? a tennis racket and going to, yeah. Yes. And so every interest that our teens might have for sure is going to like influence, yeah, priced in or out of based on whether that's family income or their specific independent income for those hobbies and interests. So absolutely. Well, this brings us to a little more reality here as we think about, okay, you're telling me all this stuff about teens and how they understand and kind of don't understand, <laughs> but do understand more than we give them credit for related to money. And so how do we nail this down as a parent? How do we really dig in and strategize how to talk with and teach our kids about money? And so we have two strategies this week for teens. One, the first is related to experiential learning, which we talked about last week. Basically, the idea of like creating opportunities and letting our kids have opportunities really related to money and trying things out again. Like I said, love to say low consequence. But yes, the whole idea of jobs or internships or setting their own financial goals and interest, the more opportunities we can help give them, right? The more blocks, if you will, of financial experiences, they benefit from that. And one that really stands out to me, I want to lean back into all the parenting skills we know. I think money in particular with our teens can be a really important place to utilize natural consequences. And I actually, so often we think about with consequences, like setting consequences. And I want to say you have to let the consequences instead of set them with a natural consequence. Sometimes it is letting your child experience the disappointment of I had planned to save for this and I didn't, and now I can't do it. Um, now again, within your reason and best judgment, but I think sometimes as parents, we are so quick to protect our kids from disappointment um, and, and myself included, right? Like, oh, you're so sad and I can <laughs> fix this for you, right? Like I talked about teaching my daughter about tax. She wanted to get that thing um, and she didn't have enough money. And I, yes, I could have purchased it, 
I, I did have the funds right there that I could. And I needed to, I felt I needed to let her experience that natural consequence, that, that disappointment of like, you chose something that costs too much and you can't afford it. Um, and so I do think that's an important experiential learning opportunity uh, for our teens. What would you add about experiential learning for teens, Suzanne? Oh, well, um, we, the phrase um, financial apprentice, Mm. The idea that, you know, the, you could consider your teen your little financial apprentice if you really want to try and give them some uh, experiences, experiential learning so that they become more financially capable. So um, mm. teaching them how to pay a bill, showing them how you pay the bill, have them pay the bill for yes. you online. Like, you know, that that's one example of experiential mm. learning. Um, simulate, Yeah. And, and like in schools and community organizations, a lot of teens will get experiences with simulations. And that's, I know, not giving them the natural consequences. It's actually, again, a safe opportunity, but low like, they're creating a low consequence experience, right? Yeah. Like the experiences they didn't do well, or maybe get what they wanted in the simulation. That's very low consequence. That's great. Yeah, yeah. And we actually use it for adults, too. So we have a, um, a retirement planning simulation mm. where, you know, OK, the, you get your, your scenario of who you are and who your persona is. So like with kids, we do it like, OK, this is your profession. This is the amount mm. of money you make. And now you're going to go in, in in this safe environment, go shop the realities of, of what life costs. So mm -hmm. housing, selecting your, lo you know, where you want to live, what you want to drive, what your hobbies and interests are, right? What mm. you can afford to do. We do the same thing with retirement. So here you are, you're a person in retirement and you didn't save for retirement. And so you have this many beans and you have all mm. of these expenses and they change, you know, over time. Yes. Healthcare expenses become more, more right? I mean, yes. tend to increase the older we get. We want to maybe do certain interests and hobbies, even as, as older adults, right? Yes. Uh, traveling or whatever the hobby is. Mm -hmm. And you can only do a certain amount if you don't um, prepare, plan and Yes. You know, um, have the resources for it. So I love yes, the idea. Yeah. The idea of simulations as experiential learning. And yes, whether that is right. Organizations or schools often do that, but we can even kind of do that in our family, you know, like a, a low tech version, if you will, of like, okay, try to figure this out, you know, um, passing the, I don't want to say passing the book, <laughs> but like passing the opportunity to our team to maybe, okay, we've got this tough financial decision to make. How would like, what's going to influence this decision for us. And I love that. And that term of financial apprentice, I'm almost like, that's like a mindset, right? Mm. I don't even have to think a specific action as much as like, if I think about my teen as a, my financial apprentice, it, it helps me find, like seek opportunities, right? If I think about like, my job is to teach this apprentice. If I'm like mentoring someone at work or maybe in school, if I'm a mentor, those types of things. If I think about my teen that way, I, I think can think of a lot of like opportunities I would maybe seek out. So I love that term. Yeah. Yeah. I think it is a really good way to frame it too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And just okay. a gentle reminder yeah. for parents, right? Like, yes, keep engaged with them and try and give them those opportunities. Mm -hmm. That The literature tells us a lot of teens want. <laughs> yeah. They want to learn those things. They do. They're eager. Yes. Okay. So then the other strategy for teens that, and again, I think everything in this episode, everything's interesting to me because I, just, like, I knew a lot of it before. But this strategy about teaching financial research skills for teens that we can help them, right? How are you going to make this decision? How do you comparison shop? How do you decide between getting a service from this place or getting a service from that place? Um, and so I feel like some of those skills, I don't always think about that. That that's that's like an active thing we can teach is that discernment and that research of figuring it out. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So again, getting back to we're really trying to raise uh, cons good consumers, right? Mm -hmm. Good consumers. Uh, to be a good consumer, you need to have information literacy, right? Knowing mm -hmm. what reliable, non-commercial, non-biased uh, information is. Um, yes. And so being able to have research skills is a big part of being a good consumer, right? And then mm -hmm. again, making intentional decisions, like you said. So um, we know that our teens can research, you know, they are on social media, they look things up, you know, whether, yes. whether again, getting back to the personal interests, like they might search something on the internet to try and learn more about something. Yes. Um, and that, or try and find a friend, you know, in social media, that can also be applied to a financial topic, like, what's the credit best credit card you can find at this point with the best interest rate that mm -hmm. just takes a couple of um, 
couple of a couple of questions, you know, while you're searching out information and be able to compare and contrast that comparison mm -hmm. shopping that you had talked about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so yeah. there's, yeah, there's evidence that the kids, they have some money, they like to spend their money. And yeah. so, um, they should be researching some of those decisions that they're making. Absolutely. And make you sure said, you're getting the like the best buy, right? Like that rule. Yes. Three. The rule of three. Is that what you were you going to bring up the rule of three? I, I was not, Suzanne. I was okay. not headed there. <laughs> OK. OK. All right. But you well. can. I want to hear you like remind you know, everybody three, about it. If you're going to like they're really interested in different personal items, like mm -hmm. let's say they want to get a cell phone or they want to, um, you know, but whatever, whatever item is they want to buy. So you want to get the best price as a consumer, right? You want quality. You got to be able to compare quality and price, mm -hmm. that trade off. Mm -hmm. And so, yep, the rule of threes, you want to get three prices from three different yes. uh, companies. Yeah. Yes. So I was going to go, it's actually, it ties in nicely. So this works. Um, <laughs> but you've mentioned the idea, you kind of mentioned it a little earlier in the episode, but we didn't say it explicitly. This idea of making the experience concrete, right? So like the just in time, the relevant teaching moment um, that as we think about helping our kids with our teens with these research skills or with experiential learning, that it's like something that's relevant to them right now, right? So not necessarily like, let's go look up mortgage rates and where are you going <laughs> to get a house loan, right? But like, okay, you're interested in getting a vehicle, right? Mm -hmm. Or you're interested. I'm like, there's in Iowa, we have a lot of mopeds. I have a lot of mopeds in our town, right? Uh -huh. And so I'm like, okay, you're interested in a moped. Let's let's research that, right? And using those skills in the kind of like relevant interest, relevant moment is something you've kind of highlighted as important too, right? Yeah, for teens or adults, we find yeah, yeah with financial <laughs> education that if we're going to keep them interested, it has to be relevant to them. It has to be timely, um, a mm -hmm. timely decision that they're making. So in the case of teens, they're interested in independence because they're able to get their driver's license, right? Or their yes. school permit. And so they want to have some kind of transportation. And so I think your example is a perfect example of um, you can have them research all the expenses of having a car, right? Mm. What's it going to cost in gas? What about insurance? And they oil can, changes, oil changes, maintenance, right? Yes. Um, and, ju and just the car itself. So mm -hmm. yeah, and I think that um, it's a great opportunity for kids to put their good, their good research skills to use and mm -hmm. planning. Um, yes. But yeah, but we're, we can't just sit down and be like, yeah, let's learn about mortgages. <laughs> yes. I I've mean, seen this interesting movement. Um, like, I feel like I've noticed it on social media of like teens doing actual PowerPoint presentations to their parents when they want something. Right. So they'll have, but like, I like that it's a movement that parents have like, okay, you want to do this? Show me you've done your homework. And I think that's really fascinating of, okay, you're interested in getting a cell phone. Maybe I'm not, maybe I'm on the fence about that decision um, or upgrading to a certain cell phone or right. Whatever the choice is like that they have to do a PowerPoint or have to do some kind of like presentation mm -hmm. of what they know that they've researched, that they've done their due diligence. That's experiential I, learning and teaching research skills. Like it is, it is. Yes. I've heard, I have heard the same thing um, yes. about PowerPoints and yeah, you got to sell me on this idea of what you want and it better right? be like research based. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. But you know, and because we mentioned that, that this age, they might be, might be entering the labor market for the first time if they yes. haven't already, that's mm -hmm. another great research opportunity to say, if I get a part-time job at X, um, you know, this, what are the hours? What's the pay? Are there any benefits? Mm -hmm. You know, are there day, like, are they closed? Like I look at certain businesses, I'm like, well, you know, they, they don't work in the, during these hours or they're closed yes. on these days. So, you know, this yes. works into a schedule and it's kind of a benefit. So mm -hmm. yeah, I think that would be another good opportunity for uh, teaching some oh, research yes. skills. Absolutely. Yes. How much money, or even like I'm in an extracurricular activity. Is this place friendly to that? Yeah, the uh, flexibility of scheduling. Yes. Yeah. Mm, a lot of really great opportunities to help build these skills uh, because they're eventually going to become adults. And so we want to help them have these uh, experiences and skills, low consequence. <laughs> yeah. um, if they're going to learn from hard knocks, let's, uh, I hope as a parent that I can, if we're doing experiential learning the hard way, that it's with not to their like, extreme detriment <laughs> so uh, you're such yes. a loving parent that way <laughs> oh i hope i hope i hope that's what it is <laughs> uh, but so two really important strategies we can tap into for teens is teaching these financial research skills um as one of them but also still 
thinking about experiential learning, letting them have these opportunities with natural consequences, creating them or encouraging them to get involved in places, whether at school, maybe op helping them opt into an elective that, you know, what they might get some of these opportunities or something, but um, right. great opportunities to engage with our teens. And then a final one, the whole mm -hmm. financial apprentice idea of mentoring, yes. of, men of mentoring your teen through a lot of these yes. um a lot of these decisions and products or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'm so glad you said that one too, the financial yeah. apprentice. And I also feel like that reminds us that we're modeling every yeah. second, right? If we think of them as like, I have this little apprentice following me around like for financial things, then like, Ooh, if I make this choice with them or in front of them or yes, love that. financial yeah. apprentice. <laughs> okay. Love that. Okay. Well, we are mixing it up this week for our Stop, Breathe, Talk segment. Usually we've been having it at Mackenzie DeYoung, our podcast producer, come in. This week we have our friend and colleague, Barb. So in previous seasons, we love to ask, Barb, Barb, what are you thinking? <laughs> I am thinking what a great segment you gave me because mm. we've been talking here about teens and you've been talking about parent modeling and you're leading me right down what I want to talk about, oh, which good. is perhaps something we haven't touched on is could there be conflict in mm. spending with our teens? There yes. could be. There could be. <laughs> there could be. But what I want us to focus a little bit on is exactly what you've been talking about in terms of parental monitoring, mm. parents who are watching what their kids are spending or who have a little bit of knowledge about maybe what their kids want to be buying. When those parents then model their own uh, ability to spend around a budget or save because of a budget they model those things for their teens and those teens see those things. So what I want to talk about in terms of conflict is this. If we have a situation where maybe a teen spent some money that we as an adult might think was extravagant or mm -hmm. wasn't the best use of resources, or we should have saved that money as opposed to spend it. Mm -hmm. If we start yelling and shouting and getting um, upset, yeah. I don't know that the teen is going to hear the second part of our comments about why and mm. what could we do differently next time or how can we um, resolve this conflict. But mm -hmm. if we can stay regulated as adults first mm -hmm. and then start a conversation about, let's talk through this a little bit, let's talk about you know, this spending that happened and um, why we made the decision to purchase what we purchased. Maybe it was a concert ticket, like you mentioned, Suzanne. Mm. And maybe we want them to kind of talk through that future planning that they're getting good at. They're, you mm -hmm. know, they're able to start looking ahead to the future. And maybe as a parent, I need to say to my child, I wanted you to use some of that future planning because you know you have some um, places you want to go and you want to yes. take the car, but you're going to have to use those resources for gas. Mm -hmm. And now because you bought the concert ticket, oh, now we don't have mm -hmm. the resources. You don't have the resources for your gas. Mm -hmm. And so being uh, calm and regulated as you have those discussions is going to help yes. that young person stay regulated also. Now, maybe mm -hmm. in the beginning, they're going to feel upset that you're calling them out and that's yes. uncomfortable. <laughs> but if we can all stay regulated, our executive function will kick in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll be able to make, a, you know, make uh, some comments about, well, here's what I was thinking. And, you know, you're right. You're right. Maybe I didn't use the best um, judgment here. What could we do? Help me problem solve what we can do next time or what we can do now to solve what's going on. But that whole yes. point of conflict around money can can bubble up. Oh, yes. And, if and big does, feelings. Big feelings. Big feelings. <laughs> but what we can do is just to remind ourselves first, let's stay regulated 
so that we can come out on the other end mm -hmm. with a positive, um, with a positive result. Yes. So those are, those are the things I was kind of thinking about yes. as you were having that great discussion today. Oh, that's such a good point because we, as parents, we can, right? It's like, why did you do that? <laughs> um, it can be easy to get frustrated about it. And that's such a good point that the conflict's going to happen where our values and theirs maybe, or our goals for them and their goals aren't going to align. And that's such a good point to like, we do want to think about staying regulated in those conversations sure. so they can hear us. Right. Oh, yeah. Really valuable, oh, Barb. Yeah. I love it. And especially oh. around money, that's one of the more difficult topics to stay regulated about, right? Because exactly. it's one of the largest areas. I mean, you know, a very frequent uh, topic of discussion, disagreement, yes. conflict in families oh, between couples. So, mm -hmm. Suzanne, you're so right. Even as couples try to discuss yeah, yeah. finances, and again, going back to that modeling, if kids see their parents uh, or caregivers being able to discuss money, in uh, self-regulated ways, mm -hmm. that's going to go a long way toward their own ability to manage money and to discuss money topics in the future in self-regulated ways. Yeah, mm. Barb, there's, yes. I mean, there's evidence of, you know, normalizing the money topic in the yes. family. There's evidence that's linked to marital like and partnership, like intimate relationship mm. quality um, later on. Great. So, yeah, you know, it's just yes. that ability to communicate about something that might be a trigger topic or a hot topic. Mm -hmm. And so that that carries forward to relationships. Good. So, oh. Great point. Love it. Awesome. Barb's talking all about financial socialization. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you are, Barb. Awesome. Thanks so much for hopping in with us today and talking about what you're thinking about teens and uh, money. Teens and money. You're welcome. Oh, thanks, Barb. Uh, so that kind of wraps us up today at thinking all about, like I said, teens and money. How do we talk with them? What are we talking with them about? And so we learned about you know, a lot of the development they're doing. We have our Jenga blocks, right? That they're mm -hmm. intermingling. And up to this point, right, they've built some of their executive function and they built some of their habits and norms. And in this teen years, they are really building a lot of their financial knowledge. So we can tap into that opportunity by thinking about them as our financial apprentice, by helping them learn some financial research skills, and by helping create and, as I said, letting them have these financial experiences, experiential learning. So, so much good stuff here. Yeah, the opportunity to stay regulated in these yeah. conversations with our teens is so important. So, what's coming next week, Suzanne? Well, in our next episode, we're going to talk about how to talk about money with um, young emerging adults. And so yes. today's um, information was the age of 13 to 21. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be a little bit of overlap of what we so, talked yeah. about in a way today because, you know, teens end at 19, <laughs> right? And emerging adults those two years. So um, mm -hmm. we will be talking about the emerging adults next week. Yes, we know there's so many, a lot of parents have questions about this time period that's kind of ambiguous like it's kind of like well well are they mm, adults mm, should they have this responsibility should i be help like there's a lot of questions confusion for parents in this uh, young adult age group with their kid when their kids are that age so we're gonna dig into all that good stuff next week but for today thanks for joining us on the science of parenting podcast uh like i reminded you last week we have lots of great stuff on our website where it's broken down by age so if you've got questions about teens you can head to scienceofparenting.org and find lots of great resources on our teen webpage. yeah so come along as we tackle the ups and downs the ins and outs and the research and reality all about the science of parenting the Science of Parenting is hosted by Mackenzie Johnson, produced by Mackenzie DeYoung, with research and writing by Barbara Dunn Swanson. Send in questions and comments to parenting at iastate.edu and connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. This institution is an equal opportunity provider. For the full non-discrimination statement or accommodation inquiries, go to www.extension.iastate.edu slash diversity slash ext.